In the last video, I mentioned that we were going to replace our coordinate system with a generalised coordinate system. So let's look at that in this video. I've got drawn out here three different coordinate systems. We've got the Cartesian, Cylindrical and Spherical. Now we can represent a position in our Cartesian coordinate system with an X coordinate, a Y coordinate and a Z coordinate. So there's nothing new in that, it's quite straightforward. But we can equally represent any point in this space using a cylindrical coordinate system. So say for example we wanted to pick a point on the surface of this cylinder. Then what we would need to know is the distance out to the face of the cylinder. So it's going to be given by this distance rho, which in effect is the radius of this circle. We're also going to have to work our way round the face of the cylinder by a certain angle, and that's going to be given by this angle psi. And we're also going to have the distance up the face of the cylinder, and it's going to be given by our distance z. So we can represent a point in this space here, given our rho, our psi, and our z as opposed to our x, y and z. Now we could also do a similar thing if we looked at the spherical coordinates. So in a spherical coordinate system, rather than having a cylinder here, we would have a sphere. And we could pick a point on the surface of the sphere in the similar way we picked a point on the surface of this cylinder. So in order to get onto the surface of the sphere, first of all, we would have to work out the radius of the sphere. So we're going to have a radius given by r, and then we're going to have the two angles. So say for instance, we are on the surface of the sphere because we know the radius r, then we're going to be able to work our way around the sphere in the xy plane. So that would be given by an angle of theta, and then we're going to work our way round the sphere in the other plane, which is the uh, z and the x plane. And that's going to be given by our angle phi. So again, we can represent a point on the surface of this sphere, or indeed any point in this uh, spherical coordinate system, given our r, theta and phi. So it means that we've got three different ways here of representing our system. And you can see here that I've actually put in some equations. So these equations here relate the cylindrical coordinate system of our independent variables rho, psi and z with the dependent variables, which in effect now are our Cartesian coordinates x, y and z. So if you like, this converts from our cylindrical coordinate system back into our Cartesian coordinate system. And we can do the same here with this one. We have our equations here that relate our spherical coordinate system to our Cartesian coordinate system. And these are the equations that allow us to transfer from the spherical system back into the Cartesian system. Of course, we could do the other way around about. We could work out a set of equations that allows us to go from the cylindrical to the spherical, or alternatively from the spherical back to the cylindrical. So we can transpose these equations and for the independent variables, variables of, say, uh, rho, psi and z, and the same way we could uh, transpose these equations uh, in order to make the x, y and z the uh, independent variables, and the r, theta and phi would then become the dependent variable. So we've got different ways of uh, representing our information, but these aren't the only ways we could come up with lots of different ways of, of representing our information. Now also the thing to note here is that this is somewhat simplified. 
because what we are going to be doing is we're going to be, rather than having in this instance here, three degrees of freedom, we could have a sphere and the point on the surface of the sphere will actually be given by not three independent variables, but it will be given by six. There would be three for the position of the centre of mass, and then there would be another three for the actual orientation of the sphere. So in that instance then, we would have our six uh, degrees of freedom. And of course, we could have uh, other systems which are more complicated, which have got uh, lots more degrees of freedom. So this is just a nice simplified way of representing our possible coordinate systems. But what we really want to do is we want to have a generalised coordinate system. So why bother looking at different coordinate systems? Why don't we just stick to this Cartesian coordinate system here, which is simple and we all understand? Well, we could start off by saying that some problems are easier to solve in cylindrical coordinates and some are easier to solve in spherical coordinates. But not only that, we also get a different insight into a problem whenever we go to, say, cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates. And then we can say, by extension, what if we were to generate a generalised set of coordinates? This would mean that we would have a, a general set of functions between the coordinates. And then we could take this generalisation and it means that we would be able to use it in a purely analytic way. That is, we would take a problem of geometry and we would replace it with a problem which really would be a problem in mathematics or, if you like, analytic mechanics. So using generalised coordinates within our Lagrangian or Hamiltonian method allows us to take a problem of mechanics, a complicated problem of mechanics, and create a solution which is far more elegant, it's far more powerful and it's far more simple than say for example trying to solve the similar problem using simple Newtonian mechanics within a Cartesian system using vector algebra. Now don't worry if you think that sounds difficult or even incomprehensible. As we work through the course, we'll work through lots of examples and you'll see exactly how this all holds together. So let's go ahead in the next slide and we'll look at generating our generalised coordinates. Don't worry too much about the mathematics here. All we're going to be interested in is what's at the bottom of this page. And it's going to be quite simple once we've worked through it. At the top here, I've taken a copy of our three different coordinate systems. So we have our Cartesian here, we have our cylindrical and our spherical. Now, in this instance here, we've only got a simple system and it's just a point on a Cartesian coordinate system or 3D space and it's represented by three degrees of freedom, which is going to be our X, Y and our Z. But let's say, for example, we had, a, as we'd seen previously, a ball and we were looking at the position of a ball. Then we're going to position on the surface of a ball. Then we're going to have six degrees of freedom. We're going to have our X, Y and Z, which gives us our centre of mass. And then we would have three angles, uh, theta, phi and psi, which would give us our position on the surface of the ball. So in that instance, then, we would have six degrees of freedom. But of course, we can extend that and we could have a system that has got uh, a vast number of degrees of freedom. Now, if I was converting from our spherical system to our Cartesian system, then I would use these equations here. Or equivalently, from our cylindrical system to our Cartesian system, it would be these equations. Of course, 
If I was just going from the the Cartesian to Cartesian, we'd simply have x equals x, y equals y, and z equals z. But what we want to do is have a general set of coordinates. So the first question is, how many coordinates are we going to have? And the answer to this, the generalised coordinates are going to be the minimum required. And we've seen in the previous video that the minimum that was going to be required for a system in 3D space is going to be three times the number of the particles minus the uh, number of constraints. So it would be 3p minus r. Now, don't worry too much about this because it's just going to disappear and we'll just replace it by some value of n because it's going to be understood that we're going to have the generalised coordinates are going to be the minimum required. So we need a name for our coordinates and generally we give the coordinates the value q. So rather than having the coordinates x, y and z or rho psi z or r theta and phi, these are going to be replaced by a generalised coordinate and we can call that coordinate q1, q2, q3, q4 and of course it can go all the way up to the minimum or generalised coordinates. So the minimum number of generalised coordinates we said is going to be 3p minus r so it's going to be q and it'll be the 3p minus r value. Again we're going through a lot of the mathematics here just to cover it in detail but it'll get simplified once we get down to the bottom. So those are our generalised coordinates now but another thing to note here is we've got a value here of time. Now in this instance up here none of these here are functions of time but in a mechanical system and the systems we're interested in we're going to have time as an independent variable. So it means also that the constraints here are can be functions of time. So what we really have here is our generalised coordinate and we write them as q1 is a function of time, q2 is a function of time, and they're all functions of time. But again, we then go ahead and we simplify this. So rather than having these q1 of t, we just put t at the end, and it just becomes another generalised coordinate. So let's look at what we have up here in terms of our spherical coordinates. We're going to have a function which takes us from our spherical coordinates back to our Cartesian coordinate. So we can see down here we've got our x1, x2, x3 and x4. So what I've done is rather than have x, y and z, I've just replaced x, y and z with the x1, x2, x3. And of course there may be more than three degrees of freedom here. So that's why rather than using these terms x, y and z, I've just used x1, x2, x3 and x4. So that's going to go all the way up to the number of degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom, which is the, the minimum number, is going to be given by that x3p minus r. And you can see here that we're going to have some function here. So the function that takes us from our generalised coordinate through to our Cartesian coordinate. And that's just, for example, this function here. So this function takes us from our general our our coordinate now in spherical, which is r, theta and phi, back to our value of x. So in this instance here we're going from our generalised coordinate. So our generalised coordinate is going to be our, a function of potentially q1, q2, q3, q4, all the way up to q3p minus r. And of course these are all functions of t. So that would be the first one. And of course then we could move on to the next one. So the value of y in this instance here would be our x2. And again this would be a different function and we called that function f2. And you can see that's the different function here from that one. And we'd have our q1, q2s up to the q3p minus r. And that's all uh, functions of t as well. And we can continue doing this all the way down until we get to the, the x3p minus r1. And that would give us our our 3p minus r function and these would be our uh, 
generalized coordinates here. So it's a bit of a mouthful that, and I've just put it in in kind of glorious detail here because usually all that kind of gets skipped over when you see it in the books. But in the end, what we can do is we'll just replace this 3p minus r just by a value and we can just call it uh, the value i. Okay, and also the function here as well, rather than calling it a function f, we'll just call it the function x. So therefore we can say that our xi is equal to xi and in the brackets we're going to have q1, q2 all the way to qn and t. So this here is really uh, our generalized set of coordinates and this is how to go from our generalized coordinates back to our Cartesian. But of course we can also do it the other way around about. We can take the Q's and instead of them being the independent variables and the value of our XI's being their dependent variables, we can change it round about so that now our X i's become the independent variables and the qi becomes the dependent variable. So all we're really doing there is just transposing the equation. So it's like transposing this equation. So rather than making uh, the r, the theta and the phi the independent variables and finding the Cartesian coordinate, we can make the x, the y and the z the independent variables and make the r, the theta, and the phi the dependent variables. So we're just transposing the equation. And this here is just a general way of us transposing the equation. So you might be thinking that we can use these generalized coordinates for all equations, but that isn't generally true. For example, if we were to look at Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, we'll find that whenever we convert that to the cylindrical or spherical coordinates, it's a lot more complicated than the f equals ma equation. Whereas whenever we use it, whenever we look at the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is central to our Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics, we'll see that this equation allows us to use the generalized coordinates. And we'll see that in the next video. So it's quite dry, this material, but it's very worthwhile going through it at least just once in detail and after that you can just accept some of the facts. So thank you for listening. I'll get you on the next video. Goodbye.